All right. Hello and welcome back to test or day number two of the broker cram section. Um, I thank you for allowing me the flexibility of doing this in two days. A um, lot more hours than I thought it was eventually going to end up being. Uh, you do have the handout with the notes to follow along. We are going to start with property disclosure, section six right here. Uh, as you remember, we talked about last week or last course that the property disclosures, it tells you it's 7% of the exam. So you can expect seven or eight questions from this section here. So the first thing I wanna talk about a little bit is about the property conditions of a property and what would actually warrant inspections and surveys. And typically anytime that you have a property uh, that's going through the conveyance process, there's always going to be some sort of home inspection. And typically that's going to be ordered by the buyer. All right. Now, a lot of houses in general will trigger certain inspections. For instance, houses built before 1978 are definitely going to have the lead based paint inspection. Um, Houses that are through VA financing are going to require termite inspections. So anytime that the property itself could warrant an inspection or the uh, loan that the buyer's using could uh, also warrant the inspection as well. What other environmental issues and disclosures? Remember, we've got the lead-based paint disclosure it's the only federally mandated disclosure there is, is the lead-based paint disclosure. What year is do we for the lead-based paint disclosure? What, what's the year of the house? Anybody? 1978, I believe. 1978, that is the date you guys should have emblazoned upon your brain. Any house built before 78 or before requires the lead-based paint disclosure. Uh, now, all other homes have that residential seller's disclosure. Remember that seller's disclosure is the knowledge that is handed from the seller to the buyer so that the buyer has a insight on, uh, you know, the condition of the property, if there's any defects. And do you guys remember which people are exempt from the seller's disclosure? I can almost guarantee that this is probably going to be one of the questions. There is a, remember the seller's disclosure, let's go over here. Doo -doo -doo. The seller's disclosure goes from the seller to the buyer, and it's the information that is given to say, hey, the roof's in bad condition, the well is fine, the HVA system, and it's that two-page form that's given. It will happen on all transactions or all conveyances, except there is a series of conveyances that are exempt. And you can almost guarantee that there's going to be a question. So who is exempt from the seller's disclosure? Do you guys remember? All right. So let's let's revisit our topic. This course is really more about you guys understanding, not me regurgitating the entire book because in 90 hours I can't do that. So are we cool? I'm looking for some input. Remember, who's exempt from filling out the seller's disclosure? Would it be if a person is selling their own residential property? For sale by owners? Yes. Are not exempt. They must fill out one. The easiest way to remember it is this. There are three groups of people that are exempt. Court ordered. So like in a trust, 
in an estate, in a will, all right? Government, I'm going to put transfer, sheriff sale, tax lien, foreclosure. And then the last one is couples. And I want to clarify that. People that know the condition, divorcing spouses, family members, business partners. So the easiest way to remember who is exempt from the seller's disclosure is to remember these three type of people. Anytime the court orders the transfer through a will, a trust, an estate, a receiver, an executor, any of those. Anytime the government transfers it, sheriff sale, tax lien, the bank is considered a government, so bank sales. And then couples, divorcing spouses, partners, family members, any of those people that already know the condition of the house. So if we got that, there's those three types of people. Cool? Thumbs up. <clears throat> Because I, now that you've memorized those three, I want to add one more. The builder. Remember the builder? When the builder transfers the new build home to the very first owner, we use that thing called a certificate of occupancy or C of O. So there are four groups of people that are exempt. And you can, I want you to memorize the first three, like I told you, court ordered, government, between co-owners or, or couples. And then the fourth one is a very gen specific person, the brand new builder. And it, the brand new builder is only exempt. This C of O is only used one time. The very first time from the builder to the new owner, and then from the new owner on down the line, you will always use the seller's disclosure. All right, so let's see what else we got. Environmental issues, lead-based paint, sump pumps, asbestos, radon, remember that chapter? Governmental disclosures, here they mean it's, this is a federal disclosure, the lead-based paint. And if you remember the sections on lead-based paint, what were they? The first section dealt with, I have knowledge and I have no knowledge. Remember, and then the second section was, I have records and I have no records. And then the seller signs it. And then the bottom half of that form, remember the buyer got all of the records. He got that little booklet from the government that talks about the hazards of lead. <clears throat> and then he got an option to check the house for lead. How many days is his option to exercise? Already wrote it on the screen. I would almost guarantee that's a test question. The buyer has 10 days to check the seller's house for lead. Now, he can either exercise that option or he can waive it. It's his option. I have knowledge or I have no knowledge. I have records. I have no records. And what you would hope is your buyer says, I have, or the seller says, I have no knowledge, no records. He signs it. Then the buyer initials 
I got all the records, which, by the way, this form is one of the records. That's why we have to give it. I got my little booklet about the hazards of lead-based paint, and I am going to waive my 10-day right to have the house inspected, and then you as the agent sign it, and that would be the lead-based paint form. But I can almost guarantee this is a beautiful test question. How many days does the buyer get? He gets 10 days. Any questions about the lead-based paint form? <clears throat> if a buyer or a seller knows of a property, he must disclose that to the seller, to the buyer coming in. Remember, it is called a material defect. It is required under our disclosure. Remember our care, obedience, loyalty, and disclosure. We are required to disclose defects. Now, interesting story. Let me tell you about something that happened just yesterday. I sit on the grievance committee. <clears throat> there was a case where there came to light after the closing that the seller may not have been honest on the seller's disclosure form. But the most important part was it also became very obvious that the listing agent knew the defect was there, and he also didn't disclose it. That listing agent will be fined probably by the board, local board. All right. So it is your job to disclose any material facts about the property. If you fail to do that, you can and probably will be brought up by the other side of the table who says, hey, I think Raymond knew that. He didn't disclose it. And now I got a problem with the property. In this particular scenario, it was, became very obvious with the facts that the seller and the listing agent knew there was a defect because the buyer found the roofing report dated two weeks before the listing happened. And the report was sent to both the seller and the listing agent. So they knew the roof was defective. They did not tell the buyer who immediately started having problems with the roof after closing and now everybody's going to be in trouble okay so you must under our obligation disclose now what is the name of the defect that you don't know about until you find it latent is it yeah latent latent defect so what happens to a latent defect after it becomes known? Material defect. It becomes a material defect. This is exactly what the story I just told you. The roof defect became known and the seller nor the listing agent changed the seller's disclosure and they both are going to end up in a world of hurt. All right. So you must disclose all the material facts that you know. Notice this word here says facts. Doesn't all doesn't just say defects. So if you know as the listing agent that the front yard is going to be taken through eminent domain by I-69, you have to disclose that. That is a material fact that will affect the value of that property. If you fail to tell, that's fraud. 
if you should have known better, remember that's called negligent misrepresentation. There's a fine line right there, potentially a good test question. If you actually knew and failed to disclose, that's fraud. If you forgot, like, ooh, I forgot to have them fill out the lead-based paint form, you should have known that. That was negligent on your part. Any questions about disclosures? When they happen, how they happen? All right. Contracts. Look at that number, 18%. This is probably the single biggest portion of the test. Anywhere from 13 to 15 questions are going to be on there about contracts. So you need to make sure you understand. Now, here's a couple of hints on the exam. Do not just think about real estate contracts. There are going to be questions about contracts in general. So for instance, can a contract be oral? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Contracts can be oral. Can a real estate contract be oral? No. No. So be careful when they start asking questions about oral contracts, yada, yada, yada. You got to remember, are, did they mention real estate contract or did they just say a contract? Because real estate works under slightly more stringent rules like this one. Contracts can be oral, not real estate. So make sure you understand that. So let's talk a little bit about contract law. Contract law is by far the most litigated law there is. What did the contract say? Well, that's not what you wrote. And I'm sure that I have shown you my favorite quote my attorney gave me one day. And I know I've showed this to you guys. Have you guys seen this? Maybe you haven't, maybe you have. What? What does that say? <clears throat> Let's see, Grandma. <laughs> now, what does that say? <laughs> Let's eat her. Nom, nom, nom. <laughs> that went from an invitation to premeditated murder in one comma. Contract law is the most litigated law there is because of stuff like this. So, there are five requirements for contracts to be valid. What, what are the five parts of a contract? You have what, consenting age, capability. Right, so you gotta have age and mental capacity, right? That's called the, the, the capacity to contract. Gotta be 18 and sufficient mental capacity got to be a legal or a, uh, yeah got to be for a legal act the contract in the tv series sopranos not legally a contract that's not a legal activity got to have compensation something of value in the real estate world we use this this is a good example of what I was talking about. The marriage contract has love, honor, and cherish that has value between people that want to get married. So love, honor, and cherish can fulfill compensation, not in real estate. All right? I have no value to loving any of you guys or cherishing you. 
So I want money in real estate because we sell at what's called an arm's length transaction, meaning I don't know who you are, you don't know who I am. So it's got to be money. Matter of fact, it's so important. Remember in our deed, we have that $10 and other good and valuable services. We have this generic statement for that. So that's how important it is. Uh, it's a promise or an obligation. I promise to give you money. You promise to transfer me the real estate. And it must be the last one. Voluntary. You cannot force someone into a contract. Now, this you will see this take the form of coercion. This happens not a lot, but I have seen it happen where a parent, where a child will convince their parent who's elderly to sell. Hey, come on, mom, list the property. You know, we got to put you in a home. Go ahead and list, go ahead and list. And then later, the mother comes back and says, my listing agreement's not valid because it was not voluntary. I was coerced into it. Doesn't necessarily mean you, somebody else did. So I have seen this happen several times. We just had in February, we had a deal not closed because the seller showed up drunk to the closing and the title company refused to sell it close it because they claimed he wasn't in his right mental state to sign legal documents. They moved the closing to the next day. So a contract has to have all five parts of these to be a valid contract. Now, when it becomes enforceable, all five parts are there. And we often see this term, when all five parts are there, it's called valid. I hope every contract you deal with is a valid contract. Here are two other terms that are confusing and I wanna make sure you get it. Somebody explain to me the difference between void and voidable. What's the difference between- Voidable void? looks like it's legit, but it's not. And what's and then, the other half of it? <clears throat> void would be one of the the five requirements are just completely missing. Exactly. You listened really well on my tapes. Void, it's missing. I send you over a purchase agreement. It's not signed. That's void. Voidable looks valid, but upon inspection, it's not. The girl was crazy when she signed it. I.e., the drunk could have looked valid because his name would have been on there, but he could have claimed he wasn't of sufficient mental capacity. Therefore, voidable can be undone. That's why they would not close it while he was inebriated because a voidable contract once they find the defect, they're like, oh, that's not a legal act. Th therefore, this contract needs to be undone. I have a question. Sure. In, in the voidable, um, it says that if you a contract with a minor is voidable, but I would have thought that it was void because they were a minor. Nope. Right. That's exactly why I'm saying you guys get the confusion. Void means it never existed because it did not meet those five things. It is completely missing one of them. I'll wash your car today, yes or no. That is void because we never talked about compensation. It was completely missing from that element. 
That contract, by definition, is not even a contract. It never was. Right, but if you, you know a person is not of age, then it, I thought it would have been a void contract, not avoidable. Anyway, I found out. The hard way? Yeah. Now, yeah. now you just said something in there that I've heard our attorneys argue before. If they signed it knowing, if they watched the six-year-old sign it, technically, the, the best example is this. 17-year-old goes and joins a gym. They sign a contract. That contract could be undone by that minor at any time until they get to the age of majority. If at the age of majority, they fail to, if they haven't canceled it before 18, it now becomes a valid one at the age of 18. But before that, they could go in and go, hey, I'm not 18, I want to cancel my gym membership because I am underage in that contract, I want to disavow it. And they would have to cancel that contract. Now, they would still owe for what they used. They can't disavow it for the purpose of not payment. So if they went one month and then went one month and then came in on the third month and tried to disavow it, they would still owe for these because they used the service. But the next 12 months that are in, under contract are canceled because they can undo that contract as a minor. Once that con person turns 18 a couple months later, this contract's now valid. They must disavow it prior to becoming the age of majority. All right. I'm also not a practicing attorney. That's what I always stand by. So keep that in mind. But I know that's correct. There's void, voidable, and unenforceable. Remember, an unenforceable, unenforceable contract. What is the word unenforceable? There is another term that you hear that goes with unenforceable. You guys remember what it was? An oral contract is unenforceable most of the time. Most of the time. But you will also hear this term, valid between the parties. Think about this. Darren, I'll wash your car today for 20 bucks. Darren says yes. That is an oral contract. However, it's also unenforceable because if I choose not to do it, the judge cannot make me wash the car. So it's unenforceable. The only time it's valid is between he and I, and we're the only ones. So it's only valid between us. It's only valid between the parties. No one else can enforce it. It's an unenforceable contract. Okay. Now, with that contract, they also have this term called executed, which means what? It means it's completed. Completed. Once the listing has been sold, we found a buyer, the property sold, that listing contract has been executed, meaning it's completed. I washed his car, he paid me the 20 bucks, that contract is now completed. It has been executed. Prior to being executed, it is actually in the status called executory, meaning it's in the process of being completed. We listed a house to find a buyer. It is still on the market we haven't had an offer yet.